Samma Sambuddhasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Samma Sambuddhasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Samma Sambuddhasa Homage to him, the Blessed One, the Worthy, Wonderfully Enlightened One. We pay homage to him, sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Okay, really good. Now, let's see. What I was saying was in 138, we're talking about agitation, agitated mental states always being born with the preoccupation of change of the material form or whatever was happening with the sense door. When something changes, the human being just automatically starts to go like this in the mind. And um, the, um, they seem to always arise together. So what that was pointing out, non-agitation <coughs> is due to non-clinging, not holding on to that and to go immediately away from it to change it. We have to do something else. So there was a discussion recently, there was a question, and I think uh, Delson was giving a talk, um, Charya Delson Armstrong, and he was giving a talk about this uh, back to the answer of the question, do we really have to put, it's a good question, do we really have to put something in place of what we're letting go of? You know, if somebody tells you just to stop doing that anymore, is it going to change in your life if you don't pay attention to replacing it with something that is wholesome. And we talk a lot about unwholesome states, wholesome states, and the Buddha hold the whole program beginning from uh, Dueda Vitaka Sutta Majima Nikaya number 19, talking about, you know, when everything was going crazy in the world, I decided to check it out. And this is before he was a Buddha. And he says, I'm going to live with the precepts and see how life goes. Then I'm going to go over here and live without the precepts and see how life goes. He's going to test everything. This is what we're trying to get you to do, to test this for yourself. If you need to, <laughs> you know, and when test everything we're saying to decide whether this really works for you or does it not work for you. That is the thing. You have to, you have to figure this out yourself. Okay, and so back there, he figured out it doesn't work so well. If you, if you don't uh, have this wholesome involved with you and you stay in the unwholesome side of things. And I like to look at that suit of 19 and say, this is why he put out this precepts are so important in the beginning to show you that I'm going to teach you this. I, this happened to me, it's like the Buddha saying, this happened to me, now I'm gonna spend 45 years teaching this to you. And as I teach this to you, I am going to show you what happened with me in several different suttas and what I tried and what didn't work and what I tried and it did work. And I'm going to encourage you and many of those suttas are directed just to his monks and those suttas are giving those monks skilled uh, drills to practice. Like when we talk about 148 and we say, okay, let's practice. What would it be like if there wasn't a self and self was not the center of everything and narcissistic actualization wasn't the way we were going to live. Just totally, it's all about me. What would happen? Well, the unselfish would be born. The unselfish that supports loving kindness would be born. And the unselfish loving kindness and compassion and forgiveness would be supported. You see, that's what would happen. And so you're finding out that the Buddha is not just teaching in normal way. Hey, this is what it's about. Do as I say, don't ask questions. No, that's not what he was doing. He even is reported to say to one of the monks, you, you got to leave. Well, why do I have to leave? Because you won't practice by the way I told you to. Knowledge and vision first, learning something by seeing it and proving it for yourself. 
you want to just listen and this and then talk to the others and stuff and not practice that way. But knowing by seeing was knowledge and vision, which was the foundation stone for the growth of knowledge and wisdom, you see? And wisdom is to be developed. That's what we're told in 44 or 43, whichever one it was, I can't remember me. <laughs> But wisdom was the one to be developed. That's what we said about wisdom. So if you're not going to develop it, you can just leave. Now, the question the other day that Delson ran into, basically, it was, do we really have to get involved with this wholesome stuff instead of what's happening? Or can we just stop doing stuff and we can make ourselves change? Well, I have a sour way of talking about that. <laughs> Yeah, because uh, because uh, the psychologists can make a lot of money if they just keep telling you, stop being angry. And then a month or so later, you come back. And then they say, you have to stop being angry. <laughs> and then you pay them again, and then you, they've got, you, you've got to come back. I don't like to talk about it that way, but for heaven's sakes, we have proved it now in neurocognitive science, in, in, in cognitive psychology, we have proved that nobody is actually has to be stuck. You do not have to be stuck with this annoying habit of something because if you let it go and replace it, each time you replace it, you are not using that neuro pathway in your brain that was the anger. You are using the building a neural pathway. Maybe it's just a footpath, <laughs> but you're going to build a new path over here. And that path is going to be about forgiveness and loving kindness and compassion. And this path was about anger and reaction and emotional outbursts. And if you don't use this one, this is the best part. They figured out on the new MRI equipment after a few months that this neural pathway starts to get broken and bent up and dries out and falls off. And then you can't see it anymore. So now we don't have to argue with the Buddha about this. And we don't have to look at it this way. We can look at the science. If you want to look at the science on this one, look at the science. Nobody is stuck anymore. Not if you're older or younger, it doesn't matter. If the older person has to work harder because this is a bigger, fatter, wider, you know, path over here you've been using, you know, a long time. But the principle is there. Don't feed it. It's going to dry up and fall off. And something has replaced it. So the Buddha is not giving you just a way to sit, be quiet, rest, be calm. If that's what you want, that's OK. If that's all you're coming for, you will get that. Just by sitting, I remember the very first time I sat in Washington, D.C. temple. I was in Washington, D.C., and the whole city was just vibrating with complications and politics and the end of the world. And oh, and somebody said, come in the temple, sit down. Now, don't move. Be still. Be quiet. Close your eyes. And 30 minutes later, I thought, why didn't anybody tell me to do this before? Why didn't anybody tell me, stop, sit down, pause? You see? And just that alone is a huge step for somebody to stop, sit alone, even if it's under one tree with a scarf over your head. And, you, lots of people do this, you know, lots of people say, okay, when this is happening in my, by my tree, if I have this over my head, don't bother me. <laughs> Everybody in the family has one. Papa has a big hat he pulls down, you know, and the kids have a scarf they put around them and cover their face. And mama has a, a nice scarf she hangs over 
uh, her head. And if mama is sitting out there, you better leave mama alone. <laughs> it's her alone time. You see? So even if you, I have taught people in India, if you only have one room, one room or two tiny rooms in your little house, tiny shed, and you're living like that, there's still a place you can sit outside next to the goats or the chickens and just curl up and cover your head and be alone or one tree in the front yard. This family said, but we don't have, a, have any space, but you have one tree, one tree. <laughs> so you put a little bench by the tree, that's your place. You claim it, you own it. And that's where you stop for a little while. If that's all you wanna do, you can do that pretty quickly. And loving kindness is a good way to do this because you come out smiling. And then you pass the smile around and the whole family is ready to eat. Even if it isn't that great, <laughs> you know, you can eat and have a really good meal together. Yeah, so that's, but if you really want to make progress in this, further than that, I mean, really experience change, the Buddha has done that for you. He has given you the programs in his texts, in the specific ones we, we try to teach you about, where you can learn all kinds of things. And that's what this one's about. So this one is the Arana Vibhanga Sutta number 139, the exposition of non-conflict. And it's a, right next to 138, which was the last one that we were talking about. And this one is about calling it non-conflict. So thus I have heard on one occasion, the Blessed One was living at Sawati in Jetta's Grove, Anatha Pindicus Park. And there the Blessed One addressed the bhikkhus thus. Bhikkhus, venerable sir, they replied, the Blessed One said this. Bhikkhus, I shall teach you an exposition of non-conflict. Listen, listen and attend closely to what I shall say. Yes, venerable sir, the bhikkhus replied and the blessed one said this. One should not pursue sensual pleasures, which is low and vulgar, coarse, ignoble and unbeneficial. And one should not pursue self mortification, beating yourself on the back, lying on nails, things like that, torturing yourself by starving and fasting way beyond sensibility. Don't do these things which are painful, ignoble, unbeneficial. The middle way discovered by the Tathagata avoids both extremes, giving vision, giving knowledge. It leads to peace, to direct knowledge to enlightenment, to Nibbana. And what's the new way we talk about Nibbana? Ah, rebooting your computer. This is your computer, yeah? And Nibbana is the experience of shutting down completely and turning on again with a default from the factory so that everything works like it did when you were five or six years old. And there's no past pushing at you. You've let it go. And there's no future to worry about because you let that go. You learned about that. You're here now, here, one day at a time, one hour at a time. You're present. So grab it and enjoy it. One should know what it is to extol and what it is to disparage. And knowing both of these, one should never extol or disparage, but should teach only the Dhamma. One should know how to define pleasure. And knowing that, one should pursue pleasure within oneself. If you want to understand that, 
you go back to 36 and read the section 30. And just below that, I think it might be 31 May, I'm not quite sure. But it tells you, there is no reason why I should not enjoy this pleasure that I'm experiencing in meditation. If joy comes up, there's no reason I shouldn't enjoy it when it comes up. As long as I know that a Nietzsche will happen and it is not permanent, it will pass away, I should enjoy it. I shouldn't try to make what happens with bliss in my meditation to try to stay. I should stay out of the way because guess what? There's more than bliss. There's reaching the point where you can shut down and reboot and restart the mind. And that's what is so amazing. That is the result of what happens with Nibbana. One should know how to define pleasure and knowing that one should pursue pleasure within oneself. One should not utter covert speech and one should not utter overt sharp speech. One should speak unhurriedly, not hurriedly. Of course, technical stuff has helped me out there. <laughs> I tell you to, if I'm talking too fast when I'm teaching, then you need to change the speed to 0.75, <laughs> okay? And then I sound perfectly right, <laughs> okay? One should speak unhurriedly, not hurriedly. One should not insist on the local language and one should not override normal usage means speak so academically that no one can understand you except the other academics. That's not what this is about. This is the summary of the exposition of non-conflict. So he puts it in this one place from the middle of section three to the bottom of that paragraph is his summary of non-conflict. Now we'll keep going. One should not pursue sensual pleasure, which is low, vulgar, coarse, ignoble, and unbeneficial. One should not pursue self-mortification, which is painful, ignoble, and unbeneficial. So it was said, and with reference to what was this said, the pursuit of the enjoyment of one whose pleasure is linked to sensual desires. If these are low and coarse and ignoble and unbeneficial, if, what does it mean? It means wrong sexuality, wrong use of sexuality, sexuality or sexual acts, which, and it is referring to this part, at any level of the development of sexual acts, I can remember someone in the who politics who said, uh, but I only kissed her. <laughs> well, we're not going to talk about what went on behind the door, you know? but anyway, um, but when you, when you did that, you opened the door to painful mental and painful physical results for hundreds of people, you know, now it isn't necessarily true that we're each going to be involved in something like that, but the relation is not just between the two people involved. We know this from looking at other scriptures or other parts of the texts. What you do affects people around you. So if mom said, don't have the relationship with this person, you better take into consideration what's going on. You'll affect mom and grandma and grandpa and everybody as far out as the relationships and family goes sometimes. You don't want a Spanish vendetta to start, a feud in the South <laughs> to start between two families. If it's not been unbeneficial, it's a state of, that is beset of suffering, vexation, despair, and fever, and it is the wrong way. Disengagement from the pursuit of the enjoyment of one whose pleasure is in such a state this is the right way. 
that's the end of that paragraph. The pursuit of self-mortification, painful, ignoble, and unbeneficial, is a state beset by suffering, vexation, despair, and fever, and it is the wrong way. Disengagement from the pursuit of that self-mortification is the way that is the right way. Now, the Buddha proved this to us. I know people who have become monks and nuns, and they want to fast until they're skeletons. And they think that they should do this because the Buddha did this. And yet, there are several suttas in here with him describing how much agony he went through for us to understand that is useless. And he tells us, it didn't help me at all. I didn't get any noble states of meditation. Nothing changed in my life. So what happens to him before he sits under the tree, before he has his experience of the super mundane Nibbana, what happens? He starts eating again. He takes a bath. He rests. He builds his body up. We don't know how long it took for him to build his body up, but we do know it wasn't just one bowl of milk rice that he ate. He prepared himself to sit under the tree with the proper amount of sleep, with the proper amount of exercise, with a body that was ready to sit under the tree until he was done. That's what he did. And it's described, it's preserved. Why do people behave this way now? Because they're not reading the suttas closely enough to remember what happened in these situations and have been led to believe they should starve themselves because he did. That's not the case. He did these things so that we wouldn't have to do it and gave us suttas and taught his own monks Please don't bother with this. 36 is an example of that. The whole front of 36 is showing you how the breathing meditation, denying yourself air was not a good idea to turn blue. Okay, it was not. <laughs> okay. It was not a good idea to clip, clip the bottom of your tongue, swallow it and breathe through your ears and turn blue. It was, it's not a good idea. It didn't help him at all, okay? I'm just letting you know, <laughs> okay? So it was with reference to this that it was said, one should not pursue sensual pleasure that is low, vulgar, coarse, ignoble, and unbeneficial. One should not pursue the self-mortification that was painful, ignoble, and unbeneficial. Now, I don't mock anything, but I was a Christian for 50 years, and nobody told me I had to be a good Christian by hanging myself on a cross or being tortured and abused the way Christ was abused. That's not what he told us. But we know he went through what he went through on the way of the cross. We know that he went through that and suffered for us. So we didn't have to do it. And there's no difference here with the Buddha. He went through six years of that. And then he told his own monks, you don't need to do this, <laughs> okay? There's an easier way, I found it, and here it is. So it was in reference to this that it was, he, he said not to pursue these things. In section five, the middle way discovered that the Tathagata avoids both of the extremes. Giving vision, giving knowledge, it leads to peace to direct knowledge, to enlightenment, to Nibbana. So it was said. And with reference to what was this said, it is just this noble eightfold path that is harmonious. We're looking at harmony here. And so we like to say harmonious perspective of view. Your view is the way you look at everything, look at everything in your life. And this is your perspective your life perspective, a harmonious perspective, right intention, we change a little bit and we say this is harmonious images in your mind. It's up to you. You're responsible what you keep in your mind. What you think and ponder on becomes the inclination of your mind, speech, action, and results. 
right speech, we change to harmonious communication. You don't just communicate with people by your speech. I hope you know this. If you're a mom or a dad, you understand this. <laughs> if you have kids outside and you want them to come in for dinner, sometimes all the father or the mother has to do is say, Ahem. <clears throat> dinner, it's time to come in. <laughs> Nothing else, just your voice and the position of your arm on your hip. That's enough. And they come. <laughs> okay. That's how it works. I know. <laughs> All right. Right action. We change this to harmonious movement of mind's attention. Can your attention be on what you just are doing here? That is how it leads to right action by staying in the present time, not being affected by thoughts from the past or thoughts from the future. Right livelihood. Well, that was pretty basic. You shouldn't have a job where you're dealing with human beings or weapons or poisons. Okay, but let's go a little further. If I tell you I want you to have a harmonious lifestyle, you're not going to be involved in those. But I'm also saying your harmonious lifestyle should make the space you need for where you're living so that you have a place where you can sit in meditation and keep developing your mind. Right effort is what we practice and we always talk to you about. This is harmonious practice and the correction of what right effort actually was in the Eightfold Path. To recognize unwholesome mind states in your mind, to let go and relax those unwholesome mind states, to bring up wholesome mind states in your mind, and then to smile and to relax and keep that going, those kinds of things going in your life. Because what you do in the present moment dictates what happens in the future. And you're in charge of training this mechanism here, which operates this whole entire body. Everything is run by the brain. The control center is what we're dealing with, the mind and control center to get it to communicate with us again as effectively as it did when we were children before. Right intention. Hmm, that's interesting. May, what's the more harmonious what? Can you remember? Let's see, pick them, pick them, Park. Hmm. Uh, Sister Kema, you were up to- Oh, right mindfulness, I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. So harmonious uh, observation. Our idea of mindfulness is very clear. We didn't see any reason to get too complicated about it. It's a form of observation. Mindfulness is an a form of observation and staying in the present time and helping do everything you can to stay in the present time without being affected by the past or by the future. That's what we're talking about here. So a harmonious observation going on all the time that is not too tight and not too loose, but is very, very easily focused. That's your observation and right concentration. Okay. We change to harmonious collectedness only because we don't want you to concentrate like this. We don't want you to concentrate in a pointed way. We want you to concentrate when you close your eyes to open it up to a full set of vision with peripheral vision. And just the way I'm looking at you now, I have peripheral vision. When you close your eyes, you look vastly inside. We want you to do it that way and you'll see what happens. So it was this with reference to this that it was said that the middle way discovered by the Tathagata, it avoids both of these, these kinds of extremes, both extremes. Number section six, one should know what it is to extol and what it is to disparage. And knowing both, one should neither extol nor disparage, but should teach only the Dhamma, teach you the Dhamma, how it works, and teach you how it 
works well and how it doesn't work and why, how, why, and then you keep working it correctly. That's what it is. So it was said with reference to what was this said, how bhikkhus does there come to be the ex extolling and disparaging and failure to teach only the Dhamma? Well, when one says all those engaged in the pursuit of enjoyment of one whose pleasure is linked to sexual desires, etc., 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 is the wrong way. That's an extreme. What does that mean? Means you can smile. <laughs> means you can still have permission to laugh and play. <laughs> it means that you can still, you know, give somebody a back rub and they can give you a back rub and don't be upset about this. You know, <laughs> this is okay. You know, that's all. It's saying, let's not go to the extreme. You're not allowed to do anything. And don't you dare smile. No. <laughs> It's not supposed to be like that. This is an uplifting thing. This is something that makes you light and makes life fun. That's what this is all about. So don't turn off. It's not telling you, as a lay person especially, it's not telling you guys, don't turn off, okay? It's hard to turn me off, but, <laughs> but I can turn off. But the thing is, just in life, I don't turn off completely if I... How would it be if I taught you like this all day long? And this is all I said. Dhamma is good. Please do it. It'll make you happy. <laughs> it's not like that. The Buddha was happy. The Buddha was fun. You can see what was happening with those monks if you go to section 12 of 89. Go to 89. Let's go. Let's go back there and you can just... See what I mean? Once we find this exists, we go, aha, <laughs> this is what's really going on. Here I see the bhikkhus smiling and cheerful, sincerely joyful, plainly delighting with their faculties fresh, living at ease. They are unruffled, subsisting on what others give them, abiding with a mind that is aloof like a deer. And I have thought, surely these venerable ones perceive successive states of lofty distinction in the blessed one's dispensation since they are abiding in this way, cheerful. You see, with a mind aloof like a deer. And this I infer according to the Dhamma about the blessed one, he is fully enlightened. The Dhamma is well proclaimed by the Blessed One. The Sangha of the Blessed One's disciples is practicing in a good way. We are the happy ones. We figured it out. We're trying to show you. That's what this is about. Number seven. May, did I slip again? Here we go. Okay, how big is, does it come to extolling and disparaging and failure to teach only the Dhamma? Okay, it, it, failure. When one says that all those engaged should not pursue, pursue uh, be linked to any pleasure uh, of central desire, well, that's what I'm trying to explain to you here. When one says all those engaged in the pursuit of Self-mortification, painful, ignoble, and unbeneficial are beset by suffering, vexation, despair, uh, fever. They have entered upon the wrong way. One thus disparages some. When one says all those dis disengaged from the pursuit of self-mortification, painful, ignoble, and beneficial are without suffering, vexation, despair and fever and they have entered upon the right way one thus extols some this is when you're getting happy and everything's going well and you start to believe it it should continue to be that way you get into trouble you forget uh, lately i have been talking to someone uh, i'm trying to teach 
about this little guy named Anicha. <laughs> Anicha is this little guy, he has a little flag, you know, he waves his flag. Hello, it's me, Anicha. Nothing keeps going perfectly forever. Things are in constant change. The universe is moving. Everything is moving. Everything is in a state of flux, including you and me and everybody else. Don't presume things do not and cannot change. We would like to believe it. It's okay to get comfortable if everything's going really great. But if it starts to change, are you ready to say, okay, this is the changing stuff <laughs> and it's fine. We came to the river. It's like you're in the canoe and you're going down the river. You like canoeing, yeah? And you have to keep watching in front and, and you cannot presume what is around the next bend in the river when you're canoeing. I've been on 600 mile canoe trips. I'll never forget. Don't get cocky. Don't think just because you're paddling along that around the next bend, there are no rapids. And don't think that if they were little rapids that around the next bend, there's not a big one. But then there's always something that's calm in the future in front of you, you see? But don't presume, don't project and then get angry at yourself because you projected and it turned out wrong. You're just experiencing life. When one says, all those who have abandoned the fetter of being are beset by suffering, vexation, despair, and fever, and they have entered upon the wrong way, one thus disparages some. When one says, all those who have abandoned the fetter of being are without suffering. Vexation, despair, and fever, and they have ended, entered upon the right way, one thus extols some. This is how there comes to be the extolling and the disparaging and the failure to teach only the Dhamma. Let's go look at 2060. See what they say back here, just for fun. I'm always, I'm gonna see, let's see, 12, 1260. Note number 1260. Now I'll tell you, when we talk about being Bawa, we look at the Bawa link in dependent origination. We talked a lot about this. What, what are we going to call it? The habitual tendency for emotional reactions are kept in this link. That's where they live. We tend to react in our life when something happens. We have a system, a computer section in our head, and it goes back and it grabs a picture of something that happened before in our life that's similar, and we reacted this way. Therefore, we're going to react the same way again, okay? So going back and looking at this at 1260, this is craving for being. Just below, we should read the, um, see there's Bawa Sampajanam as against the PTS, okay. Okay, so if we're referring to Bawa, he was referring to Bawa, so I'm gonna to refer to it this way. This is how there comes to the extolling and disparaging and the failure to teach the Dhamma because we're talking, read this again yourself and think about when it says being, it's talking about habitual reactions, emotional reactions that happen just the way I just explained it. And you're going to see how it's different. You see, we get caught in this. It's nobody's fault. It's just the way we grew up. We saw people around us doing this, and this is how we learned to do it. You were a kid with a bunch of family members, and you saw some uncle, and he's about to behave a particular way. You all said, 
uh-oh, he's going to behave like that again. <laughs> because something's going on with my aunt and uncle. And uh-oh, he's going he's gonna to get angry or he's going to do that again. <laughs> yeah? yeah? That's what this is. Your memory saying it's going to happen this way. You're projecting now. You're not there in the present time. You've added another element, the Bawa link, jumping in and saying, yeah, but this is what you've always done before. Aren't you going to do it again? You know, we tried to do some research on this, and we found out that people live about 85% of their lives reacting. They don't respond. They think they're responding, but most of the time they're reacting. And if they keep track of it in a notebook, they come and they say, wow, I've been living my life by reacting. I don't like this. I want to respond and live in the present time. And I want to look at each thing that's happening like a young child does. Why does a young child do that? They just don't have a past yet. <laughs> They don't have a past and they don't have a future yet to worry about. The parents are taking care of that. So their lives are a lot more fun than ours are because we're, they're not caught up in that kind of thing. But we can reclaim it. We can say the heck with this. I'm not going to react anymore. I'm going to take a look at what's going on and I'm going to make a decision how I am going to oh boy, respond to what is happening based on what it is right here, right now in the present time. And then see what happens with your life during the week. See what happens. Next part in section eight, how bhikkhus does there come to be neither extolling nor disparaging, but teaching only the Dhamma? When one does not say all those engaged in the pursuit of enjoyment of one whose pleasure is linked to sensual desires is this or that way, and they have entered upon the wrong way, but says instead the pursuit is, uh, is a state beset by suffering, and it's very clear, remembering that sort of thing, if it's done that way, is vexation, despair, and fever will come then it's, it is the wrong way. If you think everybody's going to, every single situation is exactly the same, then one teaches only the Dhamma, is teaching it clearly. If you're teaching your, yourself to see clearly what is that causing the vexation and you pay, start paying attention to it, you're going to change. You're going to change the way it is. When one does not say all those disparaged from the pursuit of the enjoyment of one whose pleasure is linked to sensual desires have entered upon the right way, but says instead the disengagement is a state without suffering, vexation, despair, and fever, and it is the right way then one teaches only the Dhamma. So this is saying, if I just teach you, you do this, this happens, that, that happens, I'm teaching Dhamma. But if I'm not, if I'm just plowing and saying all this, no more enjoyment, no more smiles, no more whistling. I remember my uncle who did not understand what I was doing, came to me and said, you are far too happy to be a Buddhist. <laughs> don't tell me that you're a Buddhist. <laughs> and I said, no, it fits perfectly. Now I will admit to you all, when I took the ropes, yeah. And I said, I, I took it very seriously. I would not sing anymore. Yeah, well, <laughs> I took the, the, uh, I took the chainsaw and I went out in the forest to clear the land. And I figured, you know, if I'm clearing the land, I can sing opera. <laughs> so I'm singing opera and clearing the land. <laughs> and I'm working when I'm taking care of huge fires. I'm singing. It's fine. But I wasn't singing in a way that was inviting anything. I was just 
keeping my voice clear <laughs> and later Bonte said to me you know if you sing the children will listen to you <laughs> so then I started teaching the children Dhamma when I was over here by teaching them dependent origination, teaching them the seven factors of enlightenment, teaching them games that had music, you see? Because children can learn the music. So music is a communication. And the thing is, music is the way I really speak. And so for some people, you cannot go and take the guitar away. You cannot take the one woman came to me the very sad story the woman came to me and she said i want to be a buddhist but i am the second uh cello for the symphony orchestra in in, in england in london and the one tradition of buddhism said you cannot play the cello anymore <laughs> Do you know how long this woman grew up with the cello? Do you know how hard it was to learn the technical aspect of a cello? <clears throat> Do you realize how hard it was to be able to, to actually play a full concerto on a cello? I mean, this woman was amazing. And they're telling her she cannot be considered a Buddhist if she plays the cello. This is coming from obviously a human being who is not musical, and who can actually speak and do other things to communicate. But a musician or an entertainer is a person in many situations where we speak, we are a totally different person if we are using our music to express ourselves. And she was depressed and she wanted to quit. And I said, well, let's start first with loving kindness. <laughs> let's learn about how to smile again. And then let's pick up the cello and see what happens. And then she went back to the cello and she became not depressed and got really happy. You cannot take the way a person has learned to speak in this world away from them, you see? And then tell them, you cannot be a Buddhist if you cannot, you know, like this. You cannot do that. So this is a misunderstanding of extremism and a misunderstanding. You see? Thank you, Mirko. I needed to take a drink. <laughs> okay. So now let's go to this next one. Uh, I'm at eight, is that right? I'm eight? Okay. And how big is, does there come to be neither extolling nor disparaging, but teaching only the Dhamma when one does not say all these things are engaged in the pursuit of the enjoyment of one whose pleasure is linked to sensual desires, they've entered upon the wrong way. I think we did that one, all right. I think it's the next section when one does not say all those engaged in the pursuit of self mortification he went through the whole list the self mortification um, have entered upon and gone to the wrong way I, I didn't realize there was a switch back there but there is so there's a whole list of of negative things and if you look at the negative things you cannot say that you're totally in the wrong way you know, the pursuit is a state beset by suffering, vexation, despair, and fever. It is the wrong way. And then one teaches only the Dhamma. You're telling them what will happen if you go and do these things. This is what will happen, the negative way. Then it's up to them. They choose the negative way or they choose the positive way. When one does not say all these dis, dis, uh, all those disengaged from the pursuit of self mortification have entered upon the right way, there are still things that you must do. But instead, they say the disengagement is a state that is without suffering. You're telling them why you would say disengage. You're giving them the whole story. It's without suffering, without vexation, without despair, without fever. Yeah. Then it's the right way. So all of this is very basic and very sensible. When one does not say all those who have not abandoned the fetter of, 
of being have entered upon the wrong way. But instead they say, as long as the fetter of being is unabandoned, being too is unabandoned. So look at this again. As long as the fetter of habitual reactions is unabandoned, you're not trying to let it go and replace it with something good and come back. You're not trying to learn to change a bad habit. Then that habitual tendency for emotional reaction, that is not an unabandoned. You see how if we change that, it really begins to really make sense, okay? Then we one teaches only the Dhamma. You are only teaching the Dhamma straight out. If you get telling them, when you say this is right and this is wrong, it's not real effective. But if you say, if you do this and it's wrong, this is what's going to happen. And if you do this and it's right, this is going to happen. Then you're teaching the Dhamma. You have to give them the whole lesson. So it was in reference to this that it was said, one should know what it is to extol and what it is to disparage and knowing both one should neither extol nor disparage, but should teach only the Dhamma. Now in section nine, one should know how to define pleasure and knowing that one should pursue pleasure within oneself. Again, go to Sutta number 36, look at section 30 and just below it, and you're going to see where he says that what you're pursuing in pleasure for yourself in meditation is a good thing, is not damaging, is for a pure reason. That's correct. Because there are five chords of sensual pleasure, what five? Forms cognizable by the eye, sounds cognizable by the ear, odors cognizable by the nose, flavors cognizable by the tongue, tangibles cognizable by the body that are wished for, they're desired, agreeable, and likable. They are connected with sensual desire and provocative of lust. They can be, they can be, if there's no equanimity, if there's no understanding, they can be very provocative. These are the five chords of sensual pleasure. Now, the pleasure and joy that arise dependent on these five chords of sensual pleasure are called sensual pleasures. But a filthy pleasure, a coarse pleasure, an ignoble pleasure, if it's leading to wrong morality, wrong sex, wrong this, wrong that, then you're teaching the whole picture of this whole thing. You understand? Okay. Um, I say that of this kind of pleasure, it should not be pursued and that it should not be developed, that it should not be cultivated and that it should be feared by those who are without knowledge of clinging, I, what I added on there, by anyone who, who is uh, uh, who without any knowledge of what clinging is and how it works, you see? And we have to be aware of this, we have to understand it. In, in doing things that are pleasurable and helpful for another person uh, who is ill or you're caring for someone. There's nothing wrong with touching and massage and helping the person to put a lotion on to help with muscular problems or pains or injuries and things like this. Nothing wrong with this. There's nothing wrong. But the, all this has to do with equity. Where does your mind go? How well are you trained? And the balance of your mind in what you're doing. Now here, bhikkhus, quite secluded from sensual pleasures, he says, secluded from unwholesome states, a bhikkhu enters upon and abides in the first jhana. Now, why would you abide in the first jhana, which is accompanied by thinking and examining um, thoughts with um, happiness and, uh, I'm sorry, with them, um, mm -hmm, right? Born of seclusion, right? And the second jhana and the third jhana and the fourth jhana, the usual description goes with that. This is called the bliss of renunciation, the bliss of seclusion, the bliss of peace, the bliss of enlightenment. Why? Because you're developing systematically, step by step, you're going to be growing a form of equanimity and balance, sensibility of decision. Yeah, and you're not going to have the driving automatic forces that come up inside you from before so much dictating what, what to fall into doing 
something that is not helpful. I say of this kind of pleasure that it should be pursued and it should be developed and it should be cultivated and that it should not be feared the way that he's talking about it should not be feared in, in 36 and in section 30, it should not be feared. He goes and says that to you very clearly um, in that, I'm sorry, let's see, 31. I'm saying 30 and it should be 31. In 32, thir it's uh, section 30, 32 of 36, why am I afraid of that pleasure that has nothing to do with sensual pleasures in unwholesome states? He questions himself. He says, I'm not afraid of the pleasure since it has nothing to do with sensual pleasures and unwholesome states. That's what I want you to understand. The statement that he makes in section 32 of 36. So he says, you know, Basically, if these things are not unwholesome, if these things are done out of love and compassion and forgiveness and this kind of thing, these things are not done. But if they're going towards different types of ignoble and unhealthy types of things that will cause suffering, then that's wrong. So he's telling, he's telling you he realizes this. And then he eases up. He begins to understand how things actually, actually uh, work. Okay. So they're using, basically, I'm saying, uh, and that note for 234, where it's in section nine near the bottom of the page, that's a PTS in 234, where it says that he's, that's the same sort of thing that statement is saying, I say that this kind of pleasure, that it should be pursued, and it should be developed, and it should be cultivated, and then it should not be feared that we help one another in that sort of way. So it was with reference to this that it was said one should know how to define pleasure, knowing that one should pursue pleasure within oneself through sitting in meditation, through gaining equanimity, through taking sensible actions, and carrying out the Dhamma. In 10, one should not utter covert speech. One should not utter covert, overt, sharp speech. So it was said with reference to what was this said? And the vikus, when one knows covert speech to be untrue, incorrect, unbeneficial, this is gossip and slander, one should not on no account utter it. And when one knows covert speech, to be true and correct, true, correct, and unbeneficial, one should not try, one should try not to utter it. So even though something's true in some situations, if you say it, it could be very unbeneficial, saying to use the judgment in this case. But when one knows covert speech to be true, correct and beneficial, one may utter it knowing the time to do so. I can tell you stories that would just make your hair stand on end <laughs> of women who have tried to say something truthful and explain something honest and it all caused hell to depend on, descend on the whole situation and fall apart because they didn't know it was the improper time to tell the truth. And that can happen. It can cause a wrong thing. So you have to be very, very careful of learning when it's time to say something that is true, correct, and beneficial. If you see the situation, you have to look at the whole situation to see what will happen if you say it. And it can be devastating. So it was with reference to this that it was said, one should not utter covert speech. One should only, uh, one should not utter overt sharp speech, trying to get you to look and be more careful about what you say, because once you've said it, you can't take it back. Yeah. So it was in reference to this that it was said, one should not utter covert speech. One should not utter overt sharp speech. 11, one should speak unhurriedly, not too hurriedly. As I said, modern technologies helped me out. 
with that, just put 0.75. <laughs> okay. So it was said, and with reference to what was that said? Here, monks, when one speaks too hurriedly, one's body grows tired and one's mind becomes excited. One's voice is strained and one's throat becomes hoarse. And the speech of one who speaks too hurriedly is indistinct and it is hard to understand. Here, when one speaks unhurriedly, one's body does not grow tired, nor does one's mind become excited. One's voice is not strained, nor does one's throat become hoarse. And the speech of one who speaks unhurriedly is distinct and easy to understand. I'm learning to surrender some. <laughs> I just get excited with the Dhamma. So it was with reference to this that it was said I should speak unhurriedly, not hurriedly. In 12, one should not insist on the local language and one should not override normal usage. So it was said, and with reference to what was this said, how does there come to be insistence on local language and overriding of normal usage? Here, in different localities, they call the same thing a dish, pati. They call a, a bowl, pata, a vessel, vita, a saucer is sarava, a pan, is Dharapa, a pot is Pona, and a basin Pisila. So whatever they call it in such and such a locality, one can speak accordingly, firmly, adhering to that, that expression and insisting. Only this is correct, anything else is wrong. And this is how there comes to be an insistence on local language and overriding normal usage. It can be difficult when you fight about this. And how does there come to be a non-insistence on local language, non-overriding of normal usage? Here in different localities where they call things the same thing, a dish or a basin. So when, whatever they call it in such and such a location without adhering, to that expression, one speaks accordingly. Just thinking these venerable ones, it seems are speaking in reference to this, be kind. And this is how there comes to be non-insistence on a local language and not non-overriding on the normal usage. So it was in reference to this that it was said that one should not insist on the local language and one should not override normal usage. Now, the experience I had with this was really exceptional. When I went to Central America with my mother and I had enough Spanish for the first tense, <laughs> but I did not have many tenses to speak in Spanish but I was very enthusiastic. Now, what was interesting was there was a Spanish teacher with me and she was very, very shy. She was a high school teacher who taught Spanish to, in high school, but she didn't want to engage any Spanish people at all and try to speak. <laughs> and of course, I am overjoyed at the Spanish people are so happy and everything, and I want to engage them and talk to all of them. And so in Central America, there is a thing my uncle taught me about. He said, you will experience having a conversation with somebody. And then if you don't know a word, they will just throw the word in your face and you keep talking. And they call this Spanglish, Spanglish, Spanish English like this, Spanish English. So you're Spanish and I'm English. And I say, uh, me llamo Luisa, uh, yo vive en los Estados Unidos, and la ciudad uh, is uh, Philadelphia, and mi familia, and I start talking. But if I don't have a word, the Spanish person just throws it to me, throws it to me, and keeps doing that, you know? And they keep um, 
up with me. And it's very fun. It's really fun. But she was very shy. And nobody cares when you're in the Spanish country. Nobody cares if you are only speaking one tense. If you are smiling and you are communicating, you are having a lot of fun. <laughs> and I really liked it. When I went on the other side of the world, <laughs> I went to went to Canada once to Quebec and um, I could speak only a couple of things in French. I was not very good in French and um, the French continually got annoyed with me. They got irritated with me because I couldn't speak French very well. And my husband said to me, okay, don't speak French anymore. You only have to know one thing in French. And he sent me in the store to get uh, his beer and come out. <laughs> that was all. He just wanted to have, you know, avez-vous du bien froid, s'il vous plaît. That was it. <laughs> and we, we laughed about it for years because I didn't want any beer. <laughs> He would send me to get that and come back for him. It was very funny, but the difference of the people, the one group of people totally insist that you understand the language and don't try to speak our language unless you understand it perfectly. But the Spanish, ole! <laughs> you know, let's just try to understand what's happening and let's be happy together and uh, celebrate and have a good time together and be kind. So it's very different. Yeah, this is what the Buddha is talking about. It was in reference to this that it was said one should not insist on the local language. One should not override normal usage, meaning override the visitor and make them feel bad because they cannot speak perfectly, you see? So that's what's happening here. In 13, here monks, the pursuit of the enjoyment of one who, whose pleasure is linked to sensual desires. And again, it goes through the whole list of, of um, low and coarse and ignoble and so-and-so and just -so and causing vexation and despair and fever. Okay. And the unbeneficial. The, the sensual desire that is low at versus is a state beset by suffering, vexation, despair, and fever, and it is the wrong way. So anytime it's uncomfortable, anytime it's causing you tension and tightness, you need to let go and change. This is what the Dhamma is telling you. Let go and change. Relax. Relax. And, and you know, tranquilize your mind and do things one at a time. And keep smiling. <laughs> if you keep smiling, you will be okay. Therefore, it is a state that causes conflict. But here, disengagement from the pursuit of enjoyment of one whose pleasure is linked with any sexual desires that are low and unbeneficial and that are causing problems is a state without suffering. It has no vexation, despair, or fever, and it's the right way. And therefore, it is a state without conflict. So here, the pursuit of self-mortification, painful, ignoble, and unbeneficial, is a state beset with suffering, vexation, despair, and fever. And it's the wrong way. And therefore, it is a state with conflict. But monks, okay, disengagement from the pursuit of self-mortification, painful, ignoble, and unbeneficial, is a state without suffering, vexation, despair, and fever, and it's the right way. Therefore, this is a state without conflict. Now, monks, the middle way, discovered by the Tathagata, it avoids both those, these extremes, giving vision, giving knowledge, it leads to peace, to direct knowledge, to enlightenment, and to Nibbana. It is a state without suffering, and it is the right way. And therefore, it is a state without conflict. So go over this just a little bit. Giving vision, when you are avoiding both extremes, you are avoiding tension and tightness in your mind, so you are able to 
have vision of seeing more clearly, giving knowledge, seeing how the instruction of the Dhamma is working for you in a positive way. It leads to peace. It leads to letting go of tension and tightness to direct knowledge, which is direct knowledge is seeing the reality of the Dhamma, seeing the part that really works correctly to enlightenment. It carries you forth in that condition to the level where you can go through and always remember enlightenment. Oh, I, I want to get enlightened. Don't say that to me too often because every time I tell you something you didn't understand, you got enlightened, <laughs> more enlightened. Enlightenment means I enlighten you by explaining what it is. This is a systematic road of enlightenment. The actual to Nibbana means to awakening, waking up where all of a sudden you realize totally and completely the Dhamma hooked together, connected. That's what I spend my life trying to show you. It's all connected. It's all connected. We are all connected, but it is connected and universal for all people, not Buddhists alone. That's nonsense to me. It, this was something taught to human beings. We are in a faith. We have faith that the Buddha, our faith is that the Buddha figured out how this life works. That's the beauty of the faith. But it's a universal piece of information. It wasn't meant to transform into a religion. It should have been a science, but it wasn't possible in the time of the Buddha. And it became preserved by the systems religions had at that time. This is what I really think is important to understand about Buddhism. It cannot be in contest with the Jew, with the Islamic person, with, with a person who is a Christian or anything else. It's not in competition. This is the scientific part of the operation of the human being for what? For happiness, for joy, for lightness in life and understanding clearly what is happening on the, the days that everything goes perfectly and the days that everything goes rough and accepting that little guy on the corner who's waving the flag. Hello, this is Anicca. Anicca, I'm the little guy that keeps telling you I'm waving the flag. Everything is changing. Hello, don't forget me. I'm the one that is with, uh, okay, that's enough. Okay, I'm leaving. <laughs> The flag of Nietzsche is blowing all the time around you. It can be a comfort to you because when things crash down and everything suddenly changes, you go, oh boy, it was a Nietzsche. <laughs> but you know what the answer is. It was sudden change. Here, the bhikkhus extolling and disparaging uh, and failure to teach only the Dhamma, it is a state beset by suffering. And it is the wrong way. There is a state with conflict is when you cannot teach the Dhamma properly. When we simply teach you every Sunday, there is suffering. And we never teach you there is a cessation of suffering. We are making a huge mistake for all of Buddhism and all of its traditions. And there is no argument here. There is nothing that can be presented. We need to back up and go back and relook very carefully at about 76 of the suttas in this book. And those suttas are pointing, they are pointing to the truth of the Stama. It was a way to suffer in life or a way to ease your suffering and understand how it works. There was an extreme and there was a middle part and there was this, the faith follower part down here. And people come all different reasons to follow this Dhamma, but the truth is it was a system of relief. Here because Sensual pleasure, filthy pleasure, a coarse pleasure, an ignoble pleasure is a state beset by suffering. It is the wrong way. And therefore, it is a state that is, brings conflict. 
But the bliss of renunciation, the bliss of seclusion, the bliss of peace, and the bliss of enlightenment, learning how everything works, is a state without suffering. It's the right way. And therefore, this is a state without conflict. He next one here, covert speech is untrue, incorrect, and unbeneficial state beset by suffering. Therefore, it's a state with conflict. And covert speech that is true, correct, and unbeneficial is a state beset by suffering. Therefore, it is a state with conflict. Here, covert speech that is true, correct, and beneficial is a state without suffering. Therefore, it is a state without conflict. Overt speech, overt and sharp speech that is untrue, incorrect, and unbeneficial is a state beset by suffering. Therefore, it is a state with conflict. Overt, sharp speech that is true, correct, and unbeneficial is a state beset by suffering. Therefore, it is a state with conflict. Overt speech that is true, correct, and beneficial is a state without suffering. Therefore, this is a state without conflict. Because the speech of one who speaks hurriedly is a state beset by suffering, vexation, despair, and fever. It's a wrong way. Therefore, it's a state without conflict. With conflict, sorry. Because the speech of one who speaks unhurriedly is a state without suffering. Therefore, this is a state without conflict. Here, bhikkhus insistent on local language and, and overriding the normal usage is a state beset by suffering. Therefore, this is a state with conflict. Here, non-insistence on local language and non-overriding of normal usage in the state without suffering. There's no vexation, despair, or fever. It's the right way. There is a state without conflict. Therefore, you should train yourselves thus. We shall know the state with conflict, and we shall know the state without conflict. And knowing these, we shall enter upon the way with out conflict. Now, monks, Saputi is a clansman who has entered upon the way without conflict. This is the one who came in the very beginning of the story. And this is what the Blessed One said that bunk, the monks were satisfied and they were delighted in the Blessed One's word. So, this is about your conflict, and the basic thing is common sense. And it's really a reflection of the, the Datu Vibhanga Sutta in the beginning with an unwholesome or a wholesome and a conflict or a non-conflict. So we have the power over this to change and alter things. One of the biggest things about the teaching of the Dhamma is we don't need to dive into an extreme and feel like we are trapped and caught by that our consciousness is more developed. Our knowledge that we've learned needs to be applied and used all the time. This teaching is not for just the temple. This teaching is not for just retreats. And certainly when we practice the way that we're teaching you in the meditation, when we're teaching you the Brahma Viharas, we are teaching you the way out, aren't we? Because the metta, prevents any thoughts of ill will, the karuna of any cruelty, and the mudita chases away discontent. You can't be joyful and discontent at the same time. You know, I, I tend to <laughs> start with discontent about falling off a scooter or falling on falling down. And then when I'm sitting down laughing, <laughs> I turn it into the mudita and start having a little bit of joy about the fact I'm sitting on the ground. <laughs> Maybe I shouldn't have been riding the scooter. Yeah. And then the last one is Upeka. 
Upeka is one of the yeah. biggest friends we have. And I sometimes think I see in my dreams Upeka and Anicha holding hands. <laughs> Here is Upeka, totally balanced and totally happy. And here is Anicha carrying his little flag with him saying, you know, I am Anicha, I am Anicha, I am very important. I'm Anicha, remember me, everything is changing. Don't forget, don't forget. And she says, okay, that's enough. <laughs> So let me throw it out to you now for a few minutes here. So what do you think about conflict? And do you think the sutta addresses it the right way? Hey, you, how are you? I'm good. I'm, I apologize for the quality of the camera. My, I'm on my phone today, and it's uh, it's not a not a great camera. Um, I, I think that was a a, a great talk, uh, Sister Gima. Um, really, really helpful. Um, I've got a question, uh, and the question yeah. is comparing it with the one you talked last week, um, uh, MM138, and in mm -hmm. there you warned about getting stuck in uh, the pleasure of the jhanas. And in this one, mm. it says the pleasure of the jhanas is something that can be pursued and cultivated and, and there's, you know, there's no downside to it. Can you just uh, kind of talk about that a, li a little bit more? Yeah, the, um, for the modern fellow or, act or woman, it doesn't matter. <laughs> but, you know, for the modern person pursuing meditation and experiencing the levels of the jhanas, you know, you have this joy come up and then you have uh, this equanimity that you experience, this tranquility that's different and that's more only for people that are pursuing. And you, you get to liking these, you know, and the danger is a lot of angles to this, because how did you come into the meditation? What are you trying to get? We have a lot of um, macho men, for instance, on some lists that just think this is all about bliss. You know, and this is a danger, the feeling of bliss, the feeling of the uplifted mind wanting, we have people who are saying, yeah, well, I felt, I felt PT, for instance, uplifted joy in the first jhana, but I couldn't make it stay with me all day. <laughs> so wait a second, wait a second. I know you just called me. What, what? You called me, you called me, you told me to come up again. Anicha, 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 Anicha. <laughs> All right, that's enough. <laughs> well, this is a problem with ignoring the lesson of Anicca, not being able to tolerate swallowing uh, the idea that the only way that you can really understand how all of this works is by letting go of all controls so that you can see how it just works. Many, it's not really just men, but mostly men come and they want to, they're in control of their life where they've lost control and they want to have some peace of mind and relaxation through meditation, but they're, they've made it clear in their interviews, they, they need to get control of their life again. First of all, there was no control. <laughs> There wasn't any. <laughs> they were only kidding with you when they told you you have to get control of your life when your father screamed this at you. Son, go and get control of your life. You know, actually, I have to tell you, he wasn't in control of it either. <laughs> because of why? Well, it was because of me, because of me. All right, all right. <laughs> because things keep changing. You see, and we're not in touch with that. We have this, it's not all our fault. I think we should be very kind to ourselves, male and female. We have been impressed, written to in the papers, given every magazine you can imagine, telling us what we're supposed to be, what shape our bodies are supposed to be, what shape our minds are supposed to be, what macho or male means, what female means. I'm working with people now who are working predominantly with men. And these people are doing coaching, life coaching. 
mostly for males, okay? But listening to them, I get to just listen sometimes to some of the conversations going on. And, um, and the difficulty is, yes, but I, I have to do this because I'm a man. I have to be the one that's in control. I have to be that. I have to hold on and make everything go. We have lost connection. Think about this. You, you and I have talked about this before. We're not connected to the earth anymore. If we're living in cities, we're connected to the concrete that's around us. At least we try, but it doesn't seem to respond, <laughs> you know? And we have been given this picture pushed on us through high school, even middle school and high school and college. And college is tied into the, the national, uh, you know, what is it called? The um, gross national product of the country, the financial success of your country, everything. We've been tied to everything. You know, once I had a student, let's go back a minute. Once I had a student, no matter what I told him in forgiveness, he could not get forgiveness to operate for him. And I sat in on a conversation with Bonte and him and I, I raised my hand and, and he said, what? I said, why don't we try this? I forgive myself for not ever allowing myself to just be. <laughs> That's it. And of course, where you start is be what? <laughs> Exactly, because you never thought about this. You know, what do you mean I can just be? Just be means no TV, no newspaper, no magazine, no input from the government, no input from anything, but just allow yourself to just be. And if you can just be, what would that mean? For the first few days when he took that and used it, he wept. He began to realize how he had been shaped, how he had been caressed as a baby, but then, then formulated by parents who wanted him to be this famous thing he became and had to do with being a maestro for a, a big important symphony orchestra and become one of the best maestros in the world. He realized he could not invite anyone to come to his home and just play tennis. This was funny. He could, because he would always win and people came to get beaten by him in tennis. And once he wrote me an email, I still have it somewhere where he wrote me this extraordinary email. Something absolutely amazing has happened. I thought it was a big breakthrough. I thought it was huge, you know, thing he's going to tell me. And he said, people came last weekend to play tennis with me. And I took them to our tennis court and I played tennis and we had iced tea and I lost at tennis. And I never had so much fun that day in my life. I lost at tennis for the first time in my adult life. I knew what it meant. That day he had gone to the tennis court and just decided ah, today I'm just going to just be. This is a huge message, it's huge. Who the heck are we? Who have we become that we are so out of touch with the fact that you know our consciousness is better and more developed than any other animal on this planet, and yet the most dangerous animal on the entire planet right now is the two-legged. <laughs> there is no other animal, no other reptile, no other spider, no other you know uh, poisonous frog, no other poisonous dart. Nothing. Just the two-legged on this planet. You see. We have become so disconnected. Take your shoes off. Walk across the grass and wiggle your toes. Go and find a stream or a baby pool and fill it with water when nobody's around and just sit there and put your toes in and splash the water. Connect with the water. Connect with the earth. Go up on top of the nearest mountain that looks down on where you live 
and begin to understand the insignificance of the spot you live in. When I went up on a mountain once and looked down upon the whole situation in my life, I thought, my gosh, it's all so insignificant. And that was when I first probably had an experience. Yeah, you had an experience with me. All right, all right, all right. <laughs> I'm Anicha, Anicha. Everything had changed. Everything had changed. The worst part of my whole entire life was when six or eight people died in 10 months time. I used to take walks and look up at the heavens and say, okay, God, I get it. We are born, we live, we die. Do you want to tell me how many times you're going to hit me on the head with a hammer and then say another one bites the dust, another one dies, another one dies, another one dies, another one dies until I'm crawling on the floor begging for mercy and crying through the night so I can't even stop. What is this? This is change. Change no one told me about. The fact is everybody's born and everybody lives and everybody dies but it's what you do in between birth and death how you find out that you can help people one person i was working with was going to retire he was a huge successful person with a planned retirement until he found this meditation <laughs> When after he found out who he was a little bit more and he let go and he let go and he accepted, accepted. Yeah, he gave me a place to live. I know he gave you a place to live. He gave him a place to live in his backyard. Everything was changing. He had cancer. He was going to die. But he realized something. Everybody on the planet is terminal. Mirko is terminal. Jay is terminal. Dr. Weir is terminal. I'm terminal. Okay, fine. So what? <clears throat> the doctor couldn't figure it out. He sat there and he said, you have this happening. Now they decided this last week, they are really in great shape. You don't have cancer, but you only have 50% of your bone mass in your body now. I said, that's funny. And they said, why <laughs> aren't you upset? I said, no, the only thing I'm upset about is if I only have 50% of my weight, you know, in my bones anymore, can you tell me why I still have this funny shape in my body? Can I get smaller? <laughs> I should be smaller if I only have 50% of my bone. No, it's just that now you're like a China doll. You can be careful that if you bump something, you might get a fracture. Yeah, well, that changed too. Okay, stop it. <laughs> I mean, this little guy, I've had about enough of you. <laughs> Well, I'm here, I'm here, I'm all the time, I'm here, I'm here, I know you're there. <laughs> the whole point is, we're disconnected. You see, in order to understand more about how all of this is working, we need to reconnect. So if, if it doesn't work to splash your toes in the baby pool and walk around with your feet on the grass, then what you need to do is go somewhere camping or something and dig a hole and take a bunch of water and put it in make mud and coat your legs, at least your legs up to your knee with mud and then let it dry, you see, and connect to the earth's energy. It's a frequency. You're a frequency. You have an aura. It's around you. And when you practice metta, it goes from here out to there and it shines and it's all around us and it goes out for 500 feet around us you affect people around you when you smile for heaven's sakes if you don't think so go to a shopping center and stand on the wrong side of the corridor and sit down in like a, by a by sit down in a fountain and face the people when they're walking towards you close your eyes and start smiling just smiling and open your eyes and see what's there. People will come to see what's wrong with this person. They're smiling, <laughs> but they feel they're drawn to the energy. That's what we're doing here in Gdansk. We go down, sit down at three of us and we just start smiling just to see what would happen. 
Now, these are fully grown men. I want to tell you that they're fully grown men. But then the other day, one of them came back from the shopping center. I said, what did you get today? He said, I got a t-shirt. I said, let me see it. Fantastic. It was white and pink blotches all over the t-shirt with a smile that went from here all the way around in a circle, a big smiley. <laughs> and I said, you're going to wear that. Oh, yeah, he said, you know, just to just to get people to smile. We can we can walk to the Baltic Sea from here and you just walk or you, it's not too bad to walk to the Baltic Sea from here. And um, it's quite amazing. Uh, it's a it's a sea, but it doesn't have a great big tide like I'm used to in the Atlantic Ocean. It's a little different, you know, but but the beach is very clean and everything. And I'm really amused by the difference, you know, from the East Coast, Eastern Seaboard of the U.S. But everybody just smiles. And if they're not smiling, all we have to do is walk up with his T-shirt. <laughs> and That's the end of it. Everybody's smiling. <laughs> So now tell me the question again, Hugh. <laughs> your, your mic's off. You got to turn your mic on. <laughs> it was comparing 138 and 139, where in 138, the Buddha was uh, warning about being stuck in jhana. And in 139, oh. he was saying, you need to cultivate this, you need to uh, pursue it, you, you need to uh, be with it, because basically the suggestion is there's nothing nothing wrong and, and nothing bad can happen with this type of pleasure. Uh, and so I'm just comparing those two and just uh, uh, asking, you know, when does that cultivation of uh, well, the, the pleasure- kind of, Okay, begin? the kind of, the kind of pleasure that they're referring to is what's happening in the jhana when you're meditating that kind of pleasure. Nothing yep. is wrong with that. And the biggest pro, oh, can you hold on just a second? Hold on. Hi. Um, okay. <laughs> Somebody that I've been trying to reach for at least a week in different part of the world <laughs> manages to finally ring right now, but that's all right. Okay. There was stuck, and what was the other one? May, do you remember? One was stuck inside, stuck inside, and the other one was, um, what was the other part? Stuck or what? Scattered. What? Scattered. Scattered, scattered. Scattered, scattered. scattered inside, stuck, uh, stuck at two points, scattered outside or stuck inside. So when you're in jhana, and you're working and you get stuck inside you have to get out of that to begin to practice again in order to keep your development happening okay when you're scattered outside is where the hindrances are coming and you're scattered you're pulled away and scattered to those things then you have to let go of them properly and practice your six r's to come back and stay on track now yeah. uh Mm -hmm. the, 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 the stuck, um, I don't have the Majjhima Nikaya in front of me because uh, uh, I'm not at home, um, but I think the stuck referred to uh, the pleasures of uh, within jhana, um, if I remember rightly. That's right, and, if you're and caught, so, in, that's right, that's right, that's the guy who, or the girl, either way, yeah. it's the he, so how she, do we, the he, he, who likes yeah. the bliss and wants to stay with the bliss and keep with it all day. The he, she. So how do we how do we judge when the practice has moved from what is being pursued and and constructive and good because it's pleasure within the jhana to being stuck? Where's the transition between that? You have to detect for yourself if you're smiling and smiling and just just diving into the bliss of what's happening in the jhana, and if you're if you're really there. I mean, I can see you do this in a retreat. I'll come over and poke you or I'll tickle you with a tickle stick, one or the other. <laughs> you know, I will tickle you behind your ear with a ostrich feather, and you'll know that you're either sitting with improper um, posture and you need to sit up, or else you are sitting there going, ah, ah, how wonderful, yes, bliss. <laughs> I can see you go into bliss, you know? 
How about the guy who is practicing in the level of nothingness and all of a sudden he's doing that? What's he doing in front of you? Doing something, it is nothing. <laughs> I mean, he's stuck in bliss. He's reveling in it, you see? There's one thing is to see it and, 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 and see it and be comfortable in it, but to, to uh, start clinging to it. And then you have them come to you and uh, one of two things, they will say to you, I had this really great experience and it changed. Uh-huh. That's my entry. <laughs> Anisha. <laughs> yeah, it changed and they're upset because it changed. Another one is tomorrow they come to you and they say, you know, yesterday was so great and I can't make it happen again. Now, a lot more has fallen apart beyond a Nietzsche in that case, because you forgot that in order to experience the most progressive line of your meditation, you're supposed to be doing nothing, <laughs> nothing. You're only supposed to be watching witnessing and just watching to see what happens next. You are not supposed to um, be trying to keep something going. And that also is about like when something's very, very comfortable, that's fine. Just be with it and allow it and watch it. I watch it until it ends. And then when it ends, just allow the next thing to arise. Yeah. Would, would it be would it be right then to say that what's happened then is you've moved from investigation uh, to uh, a, um, a situation where you're using that feeling as the object rather yeah. than simply being the observer? Yeah, that's right. You've turned it into an object. So your observer in the deepest states, in the deeper states, the um, observation is the is the object. And do you remember, I told you once the Buddha was an activist and sort of rebellious <laughs> and um, that he changed the way people were practicing in a very, very important way that we sometimes miss what happened. In his time, um, meditation was strictly based on an object and we heard all of the development on the idea of a subject and an object a subject, an object. I am the subject and there is the object. So I will visualize this Buddha here in my head and that will be my object. And that's what they were doing before he changes everything. But then he comes along and he changes something that's very extreme, but it isn't talked about much. It's sort of in there, it's implied and you have to discover it for yourself. He changed the whole thing and he said, but I am going to teach that the subject is the object. Aha, now something drastic has happened because although we start by using, we start out by using a spiritual friend, which is subject object, right? Subject object. We start with that and then we test our brain, but we're doing a specific thing. We are teaching ourselves. Someone said, write for us what it is that we are actually doing in this meditation. What is happening? I gave a talk about that. I don't know if it was here or where it was. And what is actually happening is we are teaching you how to reconnect a, an existing communication system within the human being that has been shut down probably since you became an adult anyway. I don't know which point that is, 12 years old or how old, but when you're younger, you have a different kind of communication system operating and you have an intention, you have an intention happen and your mind goes with you and you go, right? But as you get older, this um, intention and follow through for discovery, it breaks down, it breaks down. So we know the purpose of the object is important to understand. And a lot of times we don't hear that, but the purpose of the object is was to have something to come back to if I was pulled away, have something to come back to out here. So sending the loving kindness, that was our object. But then what happens to us when we go into the deeper states? What happens is as we go closer and closer into working uh, on um, 
on mind. Yeah, working with our mind. And um, we are just watching. Now we are just watching what? When you get to nothingness, what are you watching? It's got to be the most upsetting place for men to be. And actually women too, who if they have any responsibilities in life in big important positions, and they've been the driving force in their company or something, it's a horrible place to get to nothingness. Because after all, there's always been something that you could jump in and try to understand and control and manipulate and push around and et cetera and so forth. Now I'm saying, please watch nothing. <laughs> and they really get upset. Some of them cry. You know, some of them just get irritated. Some of them just get stuck for a number of years in nothingness. They can't grasp what it would be like to do nothing. <laughs> You know, it's pretty upsetting, you see? So understanding the object, what it was for is really, really important. The object itself wasn't to be. Actually, go back, I took somebody back, go back to 118, show me where in 118, in the instructions for the Anapanasati Sutta, show me where it says you are supposed to concentrate on the actual breath. You can do that for me, okay? Go back and find it. In, in the instructions in 118, it starts on page uh, 943, is where the first, it's section 18. Just start reading whether those instructions actually tell you, this is what Bonte Vimala Ramsey figured out. It never said in the instructions, concentrate on the breath. It never said that. This is a blow beyond imagination to people who have been trying to concentrate on the breath. Now, how serious did it become? In Australia, a few years ago, one, I asked Bonte this, I said to him in the morning when I had a question come up in my mind, how serious can that actually be? I said, I said, is it possible that a person could think that that breath was so important to concentrate on that if they didn't do that, they wouldn't breathe? I asked him that question in the morning. Now this is manifestation in action. In the morning session, I asked him that before the thing in the very morning, you know, like it before um, the precepts. In the interviews in the morning start at nine o'clock. In the morning session, one woman came in and she says, I'm having a terrible trouble sending Meta. We said, why? I'm auditing. He's questioning. She said, I just can't do it. He said, well, but what is it? Tell me the reason why you can't do it. I'm so afraid. And she was very sincere. I'm watching this from across the room. I'm very sincerely telling you she believed if she was concentrating on the metta with the spiritual friend, she would not be able to breathe if she stopped her breathing meditation that kept breaking in. You see, it kept forcefully breaking in. Now, this is a case where the person had only practiced breathing before. And when the person sat down and crossed their legs, the body said, she's going to pay attention to breath. Here we go. That's the training that had been drilled into the body. It's okay. It's good. It's good discipline. But it went too far. It wouldn't permit her to practice and learn loving kindness. This is a danger. Well, I was shocked. And then he gave her some instructions, what to do and stuff and treat it as a hindrance and just accept it. And she, she worked it out and a few days later she cleared up. But the thing was the same day in the afternoon session, a different woman, totally unrelated to this one, didn't live anywhere near her. They weren't hanging out together, nothing came in and did the same exact thing. So it answered my question, can this happen that the brain understands? You didn't tell it to do that, but takes it the communication this way 
so seriously that it believes um, that I can't breathe if I do this, I will stop breathing. Now, what the, how did we get them out of this? As a teacher, you need to know what, what, I, what I, I sort of raised my hand because I was sitting across the room and he said, go ahead. And I said to her a question. I asked her a question in the morning and I did it again in the afternoon. It seemed to help. <laughs> I said, when you were seven years old and you were outside running around playing tag with a bunch of other people, did you breathe while you were playing tag? Well, of course I did. I was running around with my friends and I was breathing and I was, of course I was breathing. And when you were in school, the very first thing they told you about the body, you see, what did they teach you? Did they tell you, did they teach you voluntary and involuntary processes that occur in your body. It's a third grade, third grade topic for science, I think. And both of them said yes. And what was the one that was involuntary? Breathing and my heart beating and my stomach digesting. Those three are the ones they remember the most, see? Okay, so when you were running around playing tag at seven years old, you were breathing. So you don't have to worry when I say, put your breathing meditation aside and just practice loving kindness. I promise you, you can tell the brain, have a little talk with the brain, you know, little talk with the brain. That's me up here. <laughs> you know, talk with the brain and let the brain know it's okay. I can, you can just don't pay attention. I'm gonna practice meta now. And that's what they played with. They played with it. They needed a game. They needed a silly game to, to practice. And bingo, it starts to straighten out. They begin to see it as an interruptive hindrance that's coming because it has a habit from the body just doing that. It'd be like you getting on a bike today and riding a bike, even though you hadn't ridden a bike for 10 years or so, you would ride just fine because it's habitually built into your body, you see? Okay, yeah. Yep, thank you for that explanation, uh, sister. Yeah, so you just don't wanna get, the only thing is when, you remember how I said when you're meditating inside, everything you can do outside, you can do inside with what you see, and decide to do with things is true, right? In other words, if you had a dream and something was going on bad, you can actually change it while you're in the dream. We know that, you can do that. We can show you, teach you how to try that. And you can put a meta bubble around yourself and protect yourself from anything that's coming after you in a dream. It'll all stop. And you can just watch whatever's happening, but you won't have any reaction anymore if you just put yourself into a meta bubble. Okay? Yeah? Yeah? So the power of the brain is kind of amazing. Anybody else have a question? Yeah? Question? Uh, Are you clear? Yeah. Mm -hmm. May. Oops, you got stuck. Yeah? Anybody else have a question? <clears throat> Hello. Hi, Mirko, how are you? Hi, Sister Kima. How are you? I'm I'm doing I'm doing really good. I'm I'm having a great time listening to you talk. Thank you. Thank you so much. You're welcome. It's I, good I, to I, see you. Yeah. I don't have a question. It's more like a comment or an addition to what uh what Huge uh asked about um being stuck uh with with this uh, the the pleasant feeling in samadhi. So <laughs> I think this this is something um, Delson said. Um, 
is to like to step back and to just observe mind being connected with whatever is happening there in in samadhi whatever state That's it is right. whatever feel whatever feeling it is is just to 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 watch mind having it That's being right. endowed with it just just to, to to also step back from mind yeah. itself and just see it That's right. like like any any other sensory experience it's just an experience and, and that's, that's it right. <laughs> yeah but it's and, all i would that, add i would add to what he says the only other thing has to do with our friend here and that is okay. you know to yeah. witness to wit watch and witness. observe wit and just witness how anicca works because when you can watch something but what's happening is if a man is not in a relationship if a man has left a relationship and had a lot of closeness but this is women too it's the he she i'm talking about <laughs> so the he she has uh left a relationship and isn't got a lot of closeness in it anymore starts to a feeling bliss is resembling something else and wants to feel that deeply again and can get it like a drug again, they will bathe in it. And that's not to be done during your meditation. You take yeah. it and you are in control. You have the knowledge of how it works and you watch by just exactly the way he described it. He does a perfect job of describing it. And then I would just add, it's a chance to see that no matter how long it lasts, Anicca wins in the end, because why? because i always win <laughs> yes <laughs> yeah. yeah okay yeah thank you yeah yeah that's it i hope it's maybe it's something uh, maybe a perspective uh it's helpful for others also to, just to to step back and just to watch see things happening no matter what it is that happens and yeah yes. and you also experienced how mind has a mind of its own in other words, how mind wasn't, you didn't ask it to do that. You were meditating yeah. and watching and you didn't stop yeah. and say, okay, mind, I'd like you to come in and do this now. So that's what he's you talking can ask, about. Though. That's, that's right. right. But you can, you can, you can ask mind to, oh, please, can you go there now? And sometimes it does. Yeah. You know, you can, can, yeah. can ask, oh, can, can you go to nothingness, please? And then it goes, for instance. <laughs> Then it comes back and asks you, why did you do that to me? <laughs> <laughs> why did you send me there? <laughs> That's right. It's absolutely right. It's right. <laughs> so where are you now, Marco? Um, I'm at my parents' place in, in, uh, in Germany. Um, yeah. I'm having okay. a um, like kind of a summer vacation visit visiting my dad. Oh, good. That's good. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's a very good exercise, actually. <laughs> good. Okay. <laughs> to to con to confront oneself with with history and habitual tendencies <laughs> with parents. Well, you know, there, I'm giving I'm giving a retreat that is over here in in um, Gdansk, and and if people want to come into this, they can add to it. Now we have ten people. We've got the retreat center. We can add two people in. So it's the uh, from the third. Let's say go backwards. <laughs> the 24th to the 30th no wait a minute that's not right it would be okay help me out here you it ends on the 30th of august 31st 31st of august anyway i, I haven't got um, the, I, I haven't got those details uh, sister i i don't think you'd uh, confirm that with me so uh, um oh, okay okay it ends it ends in the it, i thought it was the 17th to the 24th and it's not it it changed because of we didn't we didn't put the money didn't come fast enough to reserve it and so now we have it the, the last it goes to the 30th uh, 31st so 31st i think 30th or the 31st of august and count 10 days backwards what would that be 10 days backwards would be um 20th 21st to the 31st, I think it is. And it's in a really beautiful retreat center that's here uh, outside of Gdansk. I'm in Poland. And um, it's $500 for the cost of the retreat for the whole thing for the 30 day, uh, 10 days. And um, I'm really looking forward to it. 
um, has some interesting people coming that have been working in coaching and have been coached by these people. And um, the idea is to try to get this practice to be more given to people who are from all faiths, all different people, <laughs> you know, and get them to pass it on to their clients because the clients are learning this practice very quickly. And uh, it changes everything for them. And uh, teaching them how to uh, use the forgiveness and to, to use these six R's, but also to use the forgiveness and practice the metta and the karuna and together has taught has just just made really big difference for people for the last couple of weeks so we're really happy about it if you want to do it you just email me and tell me you want more information about it okay please do it soon because we need to keep sending them more money if anybody's going to come so they can make arrangements for the food and everything but the place is really beautiful and we can send you a reply. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank, thank you. Thank we you. Can, we can you know. take this, take this up very comfortably to like 15 or 20 people. It would be, I think it'll be just fine. I get kind of tired easily, but I'm, we're still fishing around trying to figure. I think it's amazing. I've had 11 tests and they're still wanting to do some, a few more tests and stuff to figure out what in the world is going on with Sister King. But when you look at the skeleton, not good, <laughs> you know? And when you look at how easily I get tired, I get exhausted if I take a walk and come back. Uh, you know, I walk for an hour and I come back, I've got to rest for two hours. It's, it's just really exhausting. But I have clean food and clean water and clean support. And I have these uh, two young, two of these young guys will carry me around if I want to go for a walk. And it's kind, kind of fun to, we do a lot of people watching. <laughs> we do a lot of, of uh, just watching people and watching what's happening with them. And um, not so much, I don't, on the, I only go to the beach like in the evening sometimes. I don't ever go down there in the daytime. But on the, uh, the main marketplace in Gdansk is a wonderful place just to sit and watch people. It's just great. A couple of weeks ago, I, had, I ran into a man that had snakes, pythons. And I thought, oh, this is so great. And he gave me the python and I sat there with it for a while. <laughs> and I, he, I said, aren't you going to charge me? And, and he said, no, because now you held the, pay, the python. Now I can have all these other women will touch it and they'll probably even want to hold it now because <laughs> I love snakes. I do. <laughs> so um, he was happy to have me uh, just hand me the python. And it was like really big, you know, coming around here and hanging down here and up. And I had her head and she just wanted to go back to him where he was. You know, I had her head in my hand, but she was just as tame as anything because she's grown up with him. That's what happens when they have a trainer from when they're very small. And this snake is like, whoa, <laughs> the snake is probably, I guess if you extended her, she might be about 12 feet or maybe 15 feet long. Wow. And very pretty heavy when they hang it around your neck. She's about like this big round up here. <laughs> But I, you know, I know that she can't swallow me, so I'm fine. <laughs> <laughs> so you all should come over because we're really having fun over here. And if you came for some days uh, to to kind of stay where we are, would be like a, a sort of like a bohemian setup. <laughs> but, but people, uh, there's a few people coming to visit from two different countries. I think now that are probably going to sleep on the floor on the other end of this place. <laughs> But it's a big location where we got this uh, apartment that someone helped them get on top of a building. And so we have the roof and everything. I told them, you know, just bring a tent, put the tent on the top of the building and sleep. Anyway, so it's kind of fun. And uh, we'll just, we're going to be teaching people in, in the framework of teaching you as a student, but we're also going to be teaching you uh, in the framework of, uh, if you're teaching when I'm interviewing, I'm going to be giving you, you know, the perspective as a teacher, what you would do with the situation. So I'm teaching you both ways in this retreat. That's one of the ideas of this. So 
think about it. And if you think you can do it, just let us know, because I know you probably need to get a flight from here to there or wherever pretty quick if you're going to do it. OK, so are we done? Anybody else have a question? You have another question, Marco? Uh, hmm? No, I think not yet. <laughs> OK, <laughs> anybody? Avish? Avinish, did you? How are you? Oh, you're you're you have to turn your mic on. Turn your mic on, Mike. It's Sorry. no, it's that's it. Good. Okay, now. Yeah, yeah. Hi, hi, sister. I'm fine. Uh, hi. How, how are you doing? I'm good. I I sent you that step three thing. Did you like that? Did you understand yes. it? Yeah. Oh, it's very that's good. good. Yeah, yeah, actually, sister, I'm asking this question because I did not do any uh, retreat because I'm doing retreat online in this month uh, in several. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. So okay. Uh, I want to ask, uh, like, uh, when we start uh, direction meditation. So uh, in beginning, we built up a metta by using spiritual friend or we directly start with directions no i wrote you the directions i sent them to you did you get them yes yes sister i, I get okay it. you don't start you just follow those directions when you've already you've already had your spiritual friend you have already had the feeling move up into your head it changes into karuna and then the next thing you're going to do is the quiz. I call it a brain quiz because all it is is you're going to look at the other kinds of people. You're going to do them very fast. You already did the other kind of people, right? Okay. You yes. already sent this to the other kind of people and you're finished. So now you're going to start the directions. So when you start the directions, you just read what I sent you and um, it'll t it's written very clearly. I sent you the advanced copy for that. So you had the whole story. And if you read it through, it'll tell you everything you need to know about that, okay? Because you just start by sending for five minutes in each direction, you see? And you're sending uh, the loving... Now, this is work, if it's turned to be soft, this was written by Bonte and I a couple of years ago. and. If it's already gotten softer when it turns into Karuna, the, the strength of it gets much softer, much lower than it was for the Metta. There's nothing wrong with that because Karuna feels like a cotton ball, like a puff of cotton ball, very soft. Karuna is compassion, right? And so the compassion, when that comes up, you can be sending loving kindness, then loving kindness and compassion, and then just compassion. It's, you have to decide what you're sending. It's okay, but you're not sending anything. This is where people get stuck. You do not send, push, deliver, mail, or use the UPS to send this to anybody, okay? <laughs> you simply shine. Yeah. You shine. When you are thinking about the loving kindness, you start to shine and that light comes out of you. You don't do anything with this meditation. You, you just um, lean in the direction. Your intention leans in the direction forward for five minutes. You're just sending. It's coming from your head. It is not coming from your heart anymore. Leave your heart alone. Okay? It's coming from, it's moved up, it's in the mind. Now you're moving into mental states. So you're sending, it's going out from the front of the cortex here in the front of your head. So you would just lean forward. If you want to lean your head forward a little bit, if it feels okay to do that, that's the direction it's going. You In your mind, you see this going to all living beings for five minutes. Then in that direction, then five minutes, to the right and five minutes to the be behind you and five minutes to the left and then um, up into the zenith to up into the firmament it's going out if you don't understand why how is it coming out of my head just pretend there's a little door here and it goes whoo and it goes whoo <laughs> you know the feeling just comes out of your head 
and it's flowing up into the zenith and then it goes down down into the earth and then it sort of winds up and you send it up again and all around you to all living beings and all you're just seeing this in your mind you're not making it go you're just shining if you want to understand i tried to tell you bonte and i wrote this thing because you're trying to make these men understand pretend you're five four or five years old and you're in kindergarten and they said send it out from you all your happiness and joy send it out from you and you just shine like a little kid and you don't question anything it's easy to do you just shine and your mom comes to pick you up after Sunday school or after you've been at the, uh, you know, the synagogue learning or the temple learning something. They come to pick you up. And why are you so happy? Because we were shining, shining to the world. That's what you're doing. You're shining like this direction, that direction, that direction, that direction that direction down here and then up and all around just like you're inside of a bubble you're sending it to all living creatures inside the bubble it doesn't have to be sentient living sentient living beings we took sentient word out mainly because plants are living things <laughs> you know and plants can react and communicate so we didn't want to have people think you can't send to the plants and the trees because they can communicate you have to learn how to do that later so you you send them out and you just let it go out and it's shining shining out that's all you're doing you're shining you know and the, and the christians i think it's i looked it up and there's a bunch of someone said well you know it's not just the christian children but the christian children said um I'm going to shine to God tonight. I'm going to shine to God. I'm going to shine to God tonight right down the line. I'm going to shine to God tonight. I'm going to shine to God. Let it shine. Let it shine. Let it shine. Whoa! <laughs> That's what you do. Literally, you have to play with this and don't take any of it seriously. Because if you take it seriously and you try to make this practice work, you will never get to cessation. I promise you because you personally have to get out of the way. You cannot be there anymore and expect to get through to uh, beyond nothingness. You can get into nothingness and just watch, but beyond that, you cannot get in the last level and fall into cessation if you are personally trying to make this happen. Because I got news for you, fellas and girls, okay? Anybody out there, okay? You cannot make this happen it's not real if you did it and you think you did it it isn't real because you do not make it happen you get out of the way and it occurs naturally from the human body and that's a fact anybody any level of society any level of wealth any level of whatever you want to talk about can do this if they can learn to just let go and watch that's it see so you sit Thanks. down and have fun with it okay you understand it better now yeah and it's a thing you just watch and you witness you don't have to do anything to it okay okay yeah yeah thank, thank you. you sister yeah thank you so uh, much good good avanish good okay yeah just a to pick up a, a, a um, comment on what you've just said I did I, I did at some stages find it very difficult just to allow something to shine uh, and I found it helpful to recognize that all I needed to do was have the intention in my mind and That's not right. worry about it. so That's just right. intend it to be forward or back left or right above and below and just leave yeah. it at that That's right yeah. it's just bare intention just a bare intention. That's all. Yeah. Anybody else? Questions? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Let's do a closing. May suffering ones be suffering free and the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief and may all beings find relief. May all beings share this merit that we have thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. 
may beings inhabiting space and earth, devas of nagas, and mighty power share this merit of ours. May they long protect the Buddhist dispensation. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. See you next.